there's a lot of different types of giving that we do here in the church, right? We give because of you know, there's a need for something that needs to get fixed. Like we, we have to give for the lights to be on, right? We have to give to fund ministries. But I want to talk about a different type of um, giving today. I want to talk about outrageous giving, okay? So when you think of something that's outrageous, you're like, you're probably worried about what my next words are going to be. So you're like, what are you talking about, right? So outrageous giving is when we look internally to the God that gave every single thing for us. Just real quickly, as a father of an only son, it kind of hits a little different when you start hearing and really, really reading about God giving his only son, right? It is completely outrageous. It's completely unbelievable and unthinkable that he would take the sins of all of us, cast them on his only son, and let him suffer and die on the cross. That is outrageous giving. And that's our Heavenly Father. That's the, that's the God that we serve is an outrageous giver. So let's talk about the church today. Currently, in today's church, on average, this isn't, these are not stats from Fairlawn Church, just so that you know. Um, Christians give roughly 2.5% of their income to the church. During the Great Depression, it was 3.3%. Okay? So this kind of falls under the line of not very outrageous. Um, another really interesting side is this is, I really enjoy this. Um, 3 to 5% of um, churchgoers give their church a regular tithe, right? However, when surveyed, 17% of Americans said that they tithe. So I like that number because that's a hard issue, right? You're like, Dude, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, look at that, boom. Oh, wow, look at all these people. Sorry. I thought that was really interesting because I think that there are, in the current state, of, and I'm not just talking about like Fairlawn Church, I'm talking about like the church as a whole. There's church attendance is declining and more churches are closing each year than are staying open. So what does that mean? What can we take away from that? And what I see in that is that when we are giving, when we are flowing, when a river flows, right, it provides nourishment to all who come to the river, right? Flowing river, like everything about that, when we picture that in our mind, we have this beautiful scene, right, of clean, fresh water where everyone comes to drink, right? Here at this church today, we're all coming for different reasons. We are all coming to the river that is God's church to, for something different right? Some of us are going through an issue at work with our boss, and we don't know if we can even bring ourselves to go to work tomorrow. And, we're all, and just me mentioning it made you feel that in the pit of your stomach. Other people are going because it's, we're, we're, we're alone, and we need people to surround us. But the river, God's church, feeds all of those who come to the church, okay? So, Think about what that would look like if instead of the river, if it, if it was a stream, right, that's a great thing. But what if it became a really, really, really big river? And what if it was flowing wild to where, every, where, where the people that are here would continue to be able to get fed from the river, we would continue to get nourished from it. But then on top of that, there would be other people. You would, have you, has anyone ever heard a really loud river before? Like, we don't have rivers that flow really loud here in Florida, but yeah, you, you, you'll be out on a trail or out in the, in the woods and you'll just hear it. And you'll, it'll just be like a, like a roar. And, you get, and you're just drawn to it. Something about you. You're just like, oh, what's it, what's it coming from? Where's the river? And you just go over there and you look at it and it's like a little waterfall and you're just, even the smallest waterfalls, we're just enamored by. It's beautiful, right? God, I believe, has that for us but it's the church. So what would, what would Fairlawn be if it was full of outrageous givers? What would this church be like if 
It was outrageous. If we gave outrageously, what would the church be? What would our kids' ministry be like? What would... We're connecting with Fairlawn School, right? We've, we're already partnering with ministries that are bringing the Bible back into public school. What if we did that on an even larger scale? What if we were able to make the, you know, the mythology that God is not in school, if, if we truly were able to shut that myth down? And it happens through generosity. What if our youth leaders, what if we poured into our, to our, to our teenagers? I can tell you, I've been a teenager, and I was not easy to love. Very honest with you. I was not an easy-to-love teenager. When I came to church as a teenager, there were so many things about myself that if I really, if, if, thank God there were no phones back then, because if I could have seen the way that I was, I would have just cringed up into the corner, and I would have just, oh, please don't make me look at that again. I know, I know, because when I was at school, I know the way that people treated me there, and I was at church, and I was, complete, I was treated completely different. So I knew that there was something about that river that I was at. Um, if Farallon were outrageous in our giving, how many more addictions would be broken? How many more families restored? All of those things are happening in this house, through this house, through the ministry of Farallon Church, which is why I'm so proud to say this is my church. There's not another church in the county I would want to be associated with because I know a, where the money is going as a deacon. I'm able to see the money flowing out into, into the ministries of, of, and that are taking care of this county that I call my home, that I've called my home since I was a toddler. So, which is a really long time now, by the way. <laughs> so what if we treated our church as if it was something greater? What if we treated it like the Bible said to treat the church? In the Bible, 2 Corinthians 11, one, um, verse 1 and 2 says, now you guys have to appreciate this. I love this. It says, I hope you'll put up with a little bit more of my foolishness. And I mean that wholeheartedly to you guys today too. That's right from the Bible. Please bear with me. Also right from the Bible. For I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. Who was he talking to? The church. He was talking to the church. So we are married to Christ, right? All right, cool. So we've established that. What if we treated the church... What if we treated that like a marriage? Be a little bit interesting, right? So for husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. And some of you guys who scrub bathrooms are like, I know exactly what that verse is talking about. <laughs> Washed by the cleansing of God's word. Amen. Continuing. He did this to present her to himself a glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they do their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife is actually shows love for himself. This whole thing that we're talking about here is parallels between actual marriage, the actual marriage relationship, which a lot of us can understand, and us being married to Christ, us being the church. So when you think about, if you're a husband, if you're a wife, if you think about the biblical definition, the way that we should react and respond in a marriage situation, it is, and one of my favorite, one of my favorite one sentence uh, explanations of marriage is two people continually trying to outperform and to outlove one another every single day, and it never, ever stops. I believe Christ is doing that. I believe he's doing his part. I believe that dying on the cross for us and 
his perfect son taking on our sin is him doing his part. So now as the other part of the relationship, what does that mean for us as a church? Well, it tells you right here. Holy, without fault. Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Wait, wait a minute. I really love my own body. Yeah, but if you were loving the church, then you were also loving your own body is kind of what it's saying here. It says, no one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are all members of this body. Raise your hand if you're a member of this body. We are all members of this body. Okay, put your hands down. Thanks. That was an easy one. So I think that there is a tomorrow or a 2.0 or a future version of Fairlawn that is known for outrageous, ridiculous generosity. And I believe that that is how everything that we get to experience here Sunday morning, everything that all of these ministries are doing gets to be magnified by five times, by 10 times, by 20 times. And that is what we're going to talk about today. But I got bills. I can't really be outrageous. The only thing in my life that's outrageous are my bills. So that's absolutely true. We all have bills, lots and lots of bills. Um, and some of them are bare minimum, just absolutely scraping by. And I think, and I believe, and I know there's tons of scriptures to back it up, that um, number one, God honors every gift. You have, to, you have to understand that. Okay, if you feel compelled to give and you hear a voice saying, God don't want that. God don't want your 49 cents. Don't give it. That is not God. He honors every gift. Interestingly enough about our bills, though, is there's a, there's a way of thinking that says if you want to know who someone really is, look at their bank account register. And I don't think it's the whole truth, but I think it's part of the truth, right? Let's look and see. We're driving down the road, and um, with me, whenever I'm doing anything physically exerting, I cannot pass by a convenience store. I can't. Like, God told me that I'm going to go in here and get pretty much whatever I want. I'm going to get a soda if I want it. I earned all those calories, right? I'm sweating, right? I have to earn all those calories back on. Like, I probably just do this for 20 minutes of work, and I'm ready to, you know, treat myself. I did not coordinate that. I don't know where that sound's coming from. Um, so I, I think it's really interesting that when you look at where your money goes, you can see where your priorities are, right? And a lot of, and, and, and those of you who've participated in any of the times I've taught FPU, that's really strange. You guys hear it? It sounds like those things that, like the, that usually go on next to the drums and someone's hitting them. I don't know. I'm going to go back there if it keeps doing it. Um, yeah, maybe it's angels. They're just like, oh, yeah, amen, amen. <laughs> maybe. So there is a, the way that we spend our money, I think, tells a lot of people about who we are, right? You can look at that and see that. So um, one thing that I think is really, really uh, an, an idea that might get you past the, uh, the bill section is that I believe that God does not want us to stay where we are today. In our, in, in, I, I believe God wants us to continue to move forward, and he says that, and he speaks it in his word. He says, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way. Not some ways, in every way. More and more like Christ, who is the head of his body in the church. Well, Christ gave everything. So as we move closer to be more and more like Christ, we will change for the better to become more Christ-like. Now, there's a really interesting uh, philosophy um, known as Kaizen. This is a, this is a philosophy that's used. Um, it was it's the reason why Toyotas are Toyotas, is the best way that I can describe it. What does that mean? 
Basically, they took this scripture, okay, and they turned it into a philosophy, which means that you're going to continue to be more and more and more like Christ, who is perfect, right? So Kaizen is a philosophy, which means good change, also known as improvement. And these are just the Japanese symbols. I thought they looked cool. Um, I really hope that's what they mean. <laughs> but the concept is something that applies to every aspect of our life. Has anyone here ever tried uh, lifting weights before? Lifting weights. Okay, see some hands up. When we first start, you don't walk up to, you guys know what a caddy is? A caddy. This is, yeah, we, 45 pounds. You, know, you can't just look at me like I'm crazy. You guys are like, what are you talking about? So a caddy is the heaviest weight at the gym. It's huge. It's really, really, it's really heavy. And you can't just walk up and just boom, and you're sliding them on. You're like, this is going to be awesome. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? And then your little noodle arms go to push it up, and you're, you're oh, that's not going to work, right? So what do we do? We eat that humble pie, and we start with the bar, okay? The bar. We start with the bar. And I remember that because that, I, I very vividly remember, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm literally, I had these two and a half pound weights on the bar, and I was like, oh, this is not fun. Because <laughs> there's other people on the other side, and the bar is just bending. You see people squatting like 500 pounds, and you're just like, okay, all right. But God did not made, uh, make us to immediately go to the 500-pound weights. God designed us to change slowly over time. That's why our muscles do what they do. They slowly break, and then they build back stronger by using the protein from our diets, okay? Um, God has designed us to change slowly over time. This whole concept of Kaizen is truly biblical, but it can be used throughout our entire lives. One thing that I think we can use it for is to start making really small changes with our finances. One thing I think we can consider the concept of financial fasting. And you're like, oh, I do not like the way that sounds. Two of my least favorite words right next to each other. So for me, that would mean I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I see a convenience store, and I'm going to pass the convenience store, and I'm going to go home, and I'm going to take my water bottle, and I'm going to push it up to the little thing, and I'm going to drink water that costs next to nothing, right? And I'll keep that $13 in my bank account. But what if I, instead of keeping that $13 in my bank account, what if I tossed it in the offering plate? What would happen to that money if all of us in the church did some form of small financial fasting? This can be anything from, oh my gosh, I really want that bouncy ball and that machine over there. And you take your quarter out and you're like, oh, I'm going for it. And you're, God's like, wait a minute, you might be able to sow that in my kingdom. And you're like, oh, I really want that bouncy ball. Take that, drop it in the offering plate, see what happens. What if, what if we learn to cook? What if instead of going to and, and, and funding the kingdom of Chick-fil-A, okay, that we split the difference and you learn to cook? It's not that hard. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can actually do that. It's really not that hard. And if you cook, if you, if, and if you want to get really special, you can start meal prepping, and you can start, like, you can really get down there, and you can eat a on a quarter of what you would pay by going out to restaurants, okay? Anyone, anyone who is trying to get on a budget and is looking for more money in their finances, it's one of the first places you can look. You can, you, trust me, you swipe in at Chick-fil-A. I swipe a lot at Chick-fil-A. I love Chick-fil-A. I don't want to tell you, to, don't completely give up on Chick-fil-A. Maybe just one meal, right? 
Okay, and this is my favorite one. For the price of a latte a day, you can have a latte. That's what I really want to have with my, with my latte per day money. If you're not a latte person, then you can very easily fast that. By the way, it doesn't count as fasting if you don't already do it, okay? You can't say, oh, I've never been to Starbucks a day in my life, I'm gonna fast Starbucks. You're like, oh, I don't, I don't even eat meat, I'm not going to Sunny's. Doesn't work like that, okay? The idea is it's something that matters to you. Um, you can give your favorite uh, st- or, or your least favorite streaming subscription, right? The other day I realized I bought Paramount Plus like three months ago and I watched, I don't know, one episode of one show yeah. and it's like, boom, boom. And it's not a lot, it's like five bucks. Yeah. And you're like, that's five bucks, no big deal. And you're like, but wait a minute, what would five dollars do in God's kingdom? It's going to do a lot. It's going to do a lot more than it is just being fed to some massive corporation who doesn't even know who I am. So take a look through your streaming subscriptions. Take a look through all of these little areas where money is just leaking through. And I'm not even asking you to take, take some of it for yourself. Treat yourself to Chick-fil-A, but pour some of it into God's kingdom and see what happens. See what happens. This, and I'm going to share this verse with you in a minute. God tells you to do that. He tells you to test him and see what happens. All right, so let's say, all right, well, I got bills, but you know, I don't think I need to give up all this money because I work too hard. I need to get the things that I enjoy doing. Got to get my nails did. I didn't say that. Someone else said I just repeated. Um, But there are lots of things that we enjoy doing, and we're able to justify them by how hard we work on them, right? Oh, I have such a hard job, and my job is exhausting, and and I'm I'm such a dedicated employee for three to four hours a day. I'm just, no. If, if that was for you, then take it, but I was just joking. Um, so this is, I think this one's really interesting to me because, um, number one, our ability to work comes from God. Yeah, yep. He gives us that. The ability for me to be up here and speak to you is because he gave it to me. Now, does that mean that I didn't have to do anything? Does that mean that I didn't have to fail a lot? Absolutely not. I had to fall a lot, and he was there for me every single time. So the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he is founded it upon the seas and he established it upon the rivers. God also says that there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different types of service, but the same Lord. There are different types of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. You guys say that? It is the same God at work. So the same God that, is, that allowed me to prepare for this message and to get up here and to speak this message is working in the people that shook your hand when you walked in this room, is working in the hands of the people who mowed the yard out here. Right. It's the same God. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be, waters, be watered. That's God's perspective, the Proverbs, the book of wisdom, sharing with us how we should live our lives in a most practical way way. You don't have to, there's no interpretation required for Proverbs. I love it. I don't have to, it's just right there. Tidbit, nugget, take this, say it a few times, it's in your head. Proverbs is such a powerful verse. I actually struggled with only using Proverbs once. I was like, my personal challenge. The last one um, is Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Bring all the tithes in the storehouse so that there'll be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Say this last verse with me. Put me to the test. God says, I dare you, bro. I dare you to sow into my kingdom. Test me and see what happens. And when we look at our God, who has modeled giving, sacrificial giving, in the most 
unbelievable way possible, it's not surprising that all of the scripture pushes you right back to the same place, to giving, sacrificial giving. Okay, but I already give. I already give. I'm good. Like, I've been chilling this whole message. So, if you're already giving, let's do this quick check. Where is it coming from? Why are you giving? Is it out of obligation? Is it out of ritual? Is it a percentage? 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 says, the point is this. <clears throat> whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. That seems a little weird, right? What have I been talking about this whole message? Giving, right? Am I trying to compulse you, compulsory you into uh, to giving? I'm not. I'm sharing, and I want you to understand and see that God's word points to giving. And if we become a church of outrageous givers, outrageous things will happen here. Outrageous things are already happening, but different types of outrageous things. No, I'm just kidding. That was a joke. Um, so, and the verse ends with, for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay? In short, God's kind of saying, like, give, but I really want it to be your idea. If you think about that, yeah. right? When... When we are working, excuse me, when we are, there's a great uh, quote from Simon Sinek. He says, working hard for something we don't care about is called stress. Working hard for something we love is called passion. And I believe that wholeheartedly means, that, or with your money as well, paying a bill that you don't want to pay is stress, right? Anybody have four pitch utilities? Oh, sorry, bad joke. That's stress. Even if it comes out of your account automatically, you're like, oh, that stressed me out just looking at that. But if it's something that you love to do, then it's called passion. Giving to the church should feel amazing. You should, you should feel, and if you don't feel that way, then that's what the leaders are here for. We're here to talk to you about that. You're like, wait a minute, I just saw somebody out here using an electric lawnmower. I don't believe in electricity. We're going to have to have a conversation. Okay? If it ain't gas, it ain't right. Sorry. Sorry, we're not talking about cars here. We're just talking about lawnmowers. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I, I, I pollute tons of gas into the, into the uh, atmosphere. Um, but God wants us to want to give. And that's just the, that's the, the wildest thing. He wants us to want to give because giving makes us more like Christ. It brings us closer and closer and closer to him. Mark 12, 41 says, and he sat down opposite the treasury and he watched people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which together make a penny. He called the disciples and he said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the offering box for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in everything she had and all that she had to live on. So to those who are already giving, this is my question. Does it hurt when you give? Is faith involved when you give? Are you a little bit like, oh, like back to the analogy about weights, right? So let's say you're already given. Let's say you've been giving for years, right? Boom, giving, 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 consistently, consistently. Now, and just, I'm not even talking about what those people's lives are like who give consistently. Their lives are fully and enriched, and enriched by God's blessing. God pours out blessing on those people who give consistently. That's all in the Bible. It's not this message. But as you continue to move on and on and on and on and on, it becomes a little bit of a habit, right? And it's already budgeted for. It's like, oh, this is no problem. It was at first really hard for me to start tithing. I had no concept of what it meant. 
until I kind of kind of got it. And then I did it for a long time, and then I started seeing the change. But eventually, it becomes kind of pretty common. Like some people even just automatically deduct their their you know their offering, and it just goes straight to the church. Don't even have to think about it. That's not really actually the best idea. You need to think about it. You need to feel it. Okay. So I believe that God wants it to. I believe He wants it to feel like. We're developing a bigger, I probably shouldn't hold the mic like that, I didn't like that, a bigger giving muscle, right? The only way that you can grow your muscle size is by lifting heavier weights, okay? So let's say you, you're like, all right, I'm going to pick up and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tithe. And you do your tithe for so long, right? And then you're able to lift until all of a sudden it doesn't really feel like it's heavy anymore. You like the way you look, but like, do you want to get a little bigger? You're going to have to pick up some of those bigger weights, okay? And if you're already giving, I believe God wants you to see what will happen to your life and what will happen to his kingdom if you give more. In 2006, Jorge Moll and Jordan Grafman, both neuroscientists at National Institutes of Health, developed an experiment to measure our neural activity when we give. Grafman and Moll's experiments in the 2000s provide the very first evidence that the joy of giving has biological basis in the brain. Subjects were given a pool of money they were allowed to keep. A computer then gave them a series of causes that they could either donate to or keep the money instead. As they made their decisions, their brain activity was recorded by fMRI. Turns out there are two reward centers of the brain that light up when people give. And these are the pleasure centers of the brain. These areas are called the midbrain VTA, as well as the subgenual area. The same parts of the brain that light up when there's food or when we think of romantic partners. These experiments suggest for the first time, we have evidence of the biological basis of the joy of giving. So God wired us this way, guys. We are created to give. We're, you guys believe we are fearfully and wonderfully made? Do you think that was God's design we just saw there on the screen? With our brain and an MRI detecting activity when we give? It's incredible, and I, I, I love seeing as we start to learn more and more and more about God's creation about the miracle that is us every single day, us walking about the earth. We have no idea all that he has done and all that he's going to do. But I do believe that here at Fairlawn, we can be known for being outrageous. Um, I believe we're not far away from a time when no one here at the church will go without. I believe that the biblical concept that was mentioned in Malachi about having a temple that is full of food is something that will represent Fairlawn Church. It will be done by us, by all of us here at Fairlawn with our sacrificial giving, with our cheerful giving, right? By taking some strategies like financial fasting, taking a look at our budget and saying, do I really need to watch four streaming networks? Yeah. I can give one to God. God tells us to test him, and I dare you to test God and to see what happens when you give outrageously. Thank you. <laughs>